24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. I'd ask that we stand and receive a greeting from this amazing creator. Our creator God says to us this morning, grace, grace, this is the beautiful blessing of God that washes us, peace, the, the shalom and the joy and the, and the peace that come when God washes us by his waters through the wonders of Jesus Christ, the one who died for us on the cross to bring us that salvation and through the work of God and his Holy Spirit in our hearts. Wash and make us clean. Amen. Let's stand uh, again and we'll remain standing and sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This is a prayer uh, full song. We ask God will be with us as we worship him. It's 521 in the red hymnals and um, we're working too on, on the, the words on the screen. But it's, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. When we sing that word, Ebenezer, God is our help. God is our help and our strength, and we celebrate that. And let's greet each other in a spirit of joy. Good morning, Mary Jean. can be seated and let's go to God in a time of opening prayer. Our Father, we praise you for the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies and the lands, for the mysteries of your creation, for the wonders we see in your world, looking up and seeing a shooting star, or the many, many stars that you have put in place. Help us to take good care of your world, and as we care for it, may that be a part of our worship to you. Thank you for making us, each one, bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Sisters and brothers in God's good grace, 
we read some more verses from God's Word that help us to know what He desires and what He's going to do uh, in our lives and with us. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He'll remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they'll say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Struck me this week that our God is a living God. He is real, and he's a God of blessing. He seeks life for us, and even flourishing of life. And in Christ, he destroys that shroud that covers up the shroud of death. Let's celebrate God's love together in song. This time, love divine, all love's excelling. We can remain seated. It's 351. We'll sing verse 1, 3, and 4. <laughs> We celebrate God's blessings to us, and I welcome Richard for it. He's going to be sharing some special music with us this coming week. We have a special day in our country, Veterans Day, and we're thankful uh, to 
the Lord for the blessings we enjoy as a nation. So, looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, beautiful, beautiful prayer for this land. We have opportunity to pray as a congregation. There's some different things that we're going to be praying for today, some special requests. One is for a member of our community, uh, Charlotte Mark, uh, who fell yesterday. And uh, we're praying for her and the doctors and to try to figure out what happened. She was taken by ambulance to the hospital. She lives in Wellsburg. So we'll pray for her. Um, we continue to lift up Richard Geiken, who fell on Monday. Um, thankfully, there were no broken bones, but um, there's pain, and we pray for him and his uh, medical care team. We lift up... Uh, Travis and Jill Hollander, uh, they're struggling with coronavirus right now, and Jill is expecting a little one in December, so we pray for them and that the Lord will be with them and, and bless them. 
Um, we also uh, are going to be praying today for, uh, in a thankful way for Marie Anderson. Um, she has a, a daughter, Cassie Dufault, who had a little baby girl. Her name is Harper May. And um, she was born and as healthy and well, and the mom is doing well too. So we celebrate God's wonderful gift of life in the Anderson family. And we also lift up um, Relin Primus. Relin, thankfully, is with us today. He's had uh, two stents put in over the last couple of days, and uh, he's doing really well. So we're thankful to God uh, for that and pray for continued blessings and healing for him. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this land. Uh, we pray for our country and we're thankful for those veterans who sacrificed to um, help this land to, to continue and we pray that it will uh, be a good place, a place of freedoms and, and love and goodness. Um, we lift up these other needs as well. We pray for Richard Geiken as he's getting better following a fall that he had. And we're thankful that he didn't break any bones, but we know there's still some pain. And I pray that the doctors will be able to help him and get to the bottom of it, what's causing it, and give the appropriate treatment to help. We pray for others who have fallen too this past week for Charlotte and Mark. Um, we pray that whatever tests are done, that they will be able to discern what's going on with her and uh, treat her effectively, that she'll be able to be restored and return to her house and to well-being. Um, we pray for Jill and Travis, Lord, as they're struggling with coronavirus, and we pray that you'll help them through this and that they'll be all right and their family. Um, please heal them and, and bless them. Lord, we give you praise for life, for Marie Anderson's family, for Kathy, or Cassie Dufault, and the little baby that was born to her, Harper May. Thank you for health and strength and for the miracle of life and for the, the little bundle of joy that is uh, theirs to care for and, and bless them in that. Lord, I also lift up uh, Rollin Primus, and we're grateful for uh, a successful procedure for him, that the stents went in well, and that he's feeling better, and please be with him as um, he heals and, and bring blessing. Um, we pray for Pastor Steve's dad, too, as he's had some tests recently, and uh, as he goes to the doctor tomorrow to hear some uh, results and probably a treatment, plan, please help him uh, as he battles this cancer that seems to continue in him. So please be with him too. Um, bless us uh, to be a blessing, Lord, and bless our gifts too. And we ask all these things in, in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the offering is received in the front and the back and you're Welcome to give in support of the kingdom. The first offering of the month is, is reserved for our church funds, uh, the general fund, the building fund, the mission and benevolence fund. And we uh, seek to continue in ministry and, and be a blessing in our community. So uh, your gifts will help that. Also, uh, there's a couple other opportunities to serve and give. Um, we have our shoebox set up, and maybe you are actually shoebox set up. It's uh, Operation Christmas Child, and uh, you maybe saw the, the setup on your way in. It's the uh, green and red shoeboxes, and the idea is if, if you'd like to help, you can grab a shoebox, and inside there's a list of some things that you can put into the boxes, and um, that will help a little boy or a little girl somewhere in this world who is in need and uh, show Christ's love to them. And you're welcome to take a box and fill it up and bring it back. Um, the collection time for returning the boxes is November 15 to 22. So it's, we have some time, but uh, it, 
there's not a lot of time to delay for it, so uh, we can get on this and, and uh, get these done. The challenge is to do all 50 boxes, and uh, you're, you're welcome. I, last year, uh, the uh, council provided the shipping costs for these boxes. If you read your little description on inside, it says you can also donate $9 uh, to that. Um, if you want to do that, you can um, put that in an envelope, maybe on top of the box, and we'll use that to defray our shipping costs. But uh, we meet tomorrow night uh, as a council, and last, last uh, year, uh, the council agreed to um, cover the shipping costs for the boxes, and, and we may do that this year. Again, I'll uh, let you know as we, um, as we discuss that. Also, um, there are some sign-ups on the table. So these lots of opportunities to be a blessing uh, today. Uh, one sign-up is for a special Christmas event in town at uh, the middle school. This Saturday, there's going to be a Get Your Christmas On event uh, held by Community Visioning, and they've got like, I don't know, 70 vendors coming. And we have an opportunity to make some bars for that. Uh, it was mentioned a little bit yes, last, last week. Uh, Pastor Zach mentioned that. And uh, we need some pans of bars, and there's a sign up there. So if you're able to do that, um, you can sign up. And there's some other instructions for where and when to bring them, um, but that's an opportunity for us. Another opportunity, Fusion. We have a great ministry going this year with Fusion, and uh, every Wednesday we're meeting at Wellsburg Reformed, and lots of kids are coming. Um, part of that ministry is we feed them. And uh, we need some supplies to keep that going. And there's a couple of sign-up sheets out on the table for that. And you're encouraged, if you're able to, to bring something to help uh, that ministry, uh, you're welcome to do that and sign up for that. I think that exhausts the uh, serve opportunity announcements for now. But uh, let's uh, praise the Lord. And our hymn of preparation is soon, very soon, we're going to see the king, and let's stand and sing. It's number 482, verses 1 through 4. <laughs>
I invite the children to come forward for a children's moment. Hey, good morning. How are you doing today? All right. Hey, Nolan. You got some goodies with you today. Wow. <laughs> Somebody likes John Deere tractors. All right, good job, Jake. Your grandpa drives a John Deere tractor? Is he busy with it now? Oh, cool. Well, that is great. Give me five. Paul, Uncle Paul rides in a tractor. Yes, I know that too. Yes. Well, I have something I want to share with you guys and show. Um, this, I usually don't bring jeans to church, but I decided I would bring these today. These are my jeans. And I have a story about these jeans something that happened to me this week. Andrew called me Tuesday night and he needed a little help in the woods. So I said, okay, I'll help you. And I had these jeans on. And he led me through the woods a long, long ways. And there were some places in that woods where it was very steep and very hilly. Yes, I did go in the woods. And it was a real adventure, let me tell you, because the, the hills were very steep, some of them, and there was mud on them. And I thought, if I step down on this, I'm going to fall. So I said to Andrew, how do you think I should get down? And he said, Dad, if I were you, I would probably just slide down on my keister. So that's what I did. I went down and it was like a slide. It was just down. And at the end I was splash in a little creek. It wasn't too deep. It was just a little creek, but it was kind of wet. Yes, my pants were so dirty. I got home, it was probably between midnight and one o'clock when I got home, and my pants were so dirty, I didn't even want to walk in the house. So I, I thought, well, nobody is going by the road, nobody will see me, I'm going to take my jeans off before I even go into the house. And so I did. And the next morning, I looked at my jeans, and they were so dirty that I thought, I don't know if I can save these at all. They were so dirty. There was so much mud on these. But I thought, well, why don't you try and see? Throw it in the wash machine. Maybe you can get them clean. So I put them in the wash machine. And after I, I put heavy wash, just to make sure I would get a good wash, and after I dried them, they came out. And look at this. They're pretty clean, aren't they? Yeah, and you might need a bath. Yeah, I needed a bath too, let me tell you. I, <laughs> I did need a bath. So, but these things, they're so clean. And then I thought to myself, that's kind of what Jesus does for me. He sees my life and he knows that I sin, that sometimes I do things that aren't right. And Jesus says, Trust in me, and I will wash your sins away. And when Jesus washes my sins away, I'm clean again, even cleaner than these jeans. My life is, is right with God, and that's the same for all of us. When we do wrong things, we can ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, and he washes us clean. And my dad fell down before. Your dad fell down before? Tell me that story, maybe after church, because I'd like to hear it too. <laughs> yes, we'll pray. You know what? Let's pray that your dad feels better soon. All right, let's pray.
Thank you, God, for this good day. And pray for Jake's dad that he'll feel better soon. And thank you for all the kids that are here. And would you bless us? And thank you that in Jesus you wash us clean, that when we do wrong things, we can put our trust in him. And it's kind of like a great wash machine that the sins that we do can be washed away from life and that we can be clean before you. And bless us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, I have the candy here somewhere. Here it is. Okay. I did. <laughs> but I found it so you guys can have some. You lost a tooth? Oh, wow. That's amazing. Guess what? Yeah, what? One time when I went to the beach, it, it said, no swimming. Oh, my. No swimming. Was that because the waves were really high, maybe? Or? Oh. I think it was because that there was growing, growing. Okay. Well, hey, I have, I have a um, question for you. Do you think you could help Nolan take some of that stuff back? Because he's going to have his hands full. <laughs> See you guys. Our um, scripture reading is from Revelation. And... The reason I'm preaching from Revelation, last Sunday, Pastor Moses Chung um, spoke a little bit about how if he could choose a word to describe the whole message of the Bible, it would be the word restoration. And it was, when he said that, I, I heartily agree with that. And it made me think of this passage from Revelation uh, where, where the Lord says, then I create a new heaven and a new earth and how God restores his creation. And I wanted to do a message on that because that is a theme that is really dear to me. And um, I think we'll learn some special things to celebrate that I hope will help us today in our walk with the Lord to be excited and encouraged of what's, what's coming and what he's up to. So this from Revelation 21, uh, 1 through 8. Then I saw, whoops, I forgot to flip the, uh, flip the screen. I'll do that a second. Okay. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he'll dwell with them. They'll be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they'll be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. All right. I was listening to the news this past week and I heard uh, something that inspired me from Queen Elizabeth, uh, a special lady, 95 years old and uh, still active. She was giving a speech in Glasgow, Scotland and uh, Queen Elizabeth 
among other things, said, if you want to lead for today, you look to things like politics and government. But she said, true statesmanship leads for the future. Now she said that at a gathering of world leaders that were meeting together and trying to find good ways to try to prevent, in a scientific term, the global average temperature from raising 1.5 degrees Celsius in a way that if that happens, certain irreversible things will be set in motion and it's been linked to more severe storms, greater flooding. What can be done? Well, I know personally from my family that there's something that's being done in the automotive world. Uh, car makers are turning their focus and their attention to electrically powered vehicles. It'll be a while before that is more common and in place, but uh, it's a common. Um, ben is working on the electrical vehicle batteries for the new General Motors Hummer, of all things, so he's been busy with that. And I know there's some other real challenges to the economy, challenges even in the agricultural world that are associated with this. This past week they talked about trying to limit methane emissions and some of the things that they would like to do to do that. And think, how is all this going to go? How is it going to be received? Um, what's going to have to be done? Um, what laws will have to be in place? It's, it's a big area. And I'm not sure uh, what's going to happen 10, 20, or 30 years from now in, in any of these things. And sometimes that uncertainty kind of gnaws at the soul. And it's this passage in Revelation that helps me gain a sense of maybe equilibrium in a world where there's a lot of debate and discussion and all the rest. That Revelation 21 gives me a picture of what is ahead and God himself says, write it down, these things are trustworthy and they are true. So I say hallelujah, there's something about the future that I can know. And it's in this amazing book, the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation is a, is a challenging book, and there are Christians, I know, I know fellow Christians who shy away from Revelation. I know preachers who are, who are squeamish about saying a whole lot about Revelation because it is a difficult book to interpret. But more than that, I have friends who are Christians who understand it very differently from the way I understand it. Um, I come at it from a reformed perspective and in that perspective I can look at things like that mention in Revelation 20 of 1,000 years and I can say well it looks like Revelation is a book that John wrote with a lot of symbolism in it and because of that and perhaps some of that symbolism is there to kind of disguise the book a little bit to those who wouldn't have known what some of those symbols would have meant and uh, help that book to, to circulate in a setting where there's hostility to Christians. But anyway, that reference to 1,000 years could be a symbol, not a, a literal 1,000 years. And my approach as an interpreter, and I, in a way this is truth and labeling, right? You know, what are you getting when you come? What perspective here? It's the word amillennial. It's the idea that, well, among other things, there could be symbolism going on with this reference to a thousand years. It could refer to the time from Christ's coming, uh, the first time to the, the time when uh, in... Uh, Revelation 20, verse 7, it says, when the thousand years are over. And then there's a commencing of, of other things. Uh, when the thousand years are over. There's, there's a confrontation between good and evil that takes place. And God wins in that confrontation. 
And all those who are the enemies of, of the good are consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, another phrase that denotes the realities of hell, a place of everlasting punishment. But our passage helps us to see what's ahead for those who are the victorious ones in that conflict. You know, God gives the victory to his people, and that victory is something we can celebrate because God says they will inherit all this. I'll be their God. They'll be my children. But then we ask, what is it, is it that we're going to inherit? And what is it going to be like? And you maybe haven't heard a lot of messages on, on heaven and what it's going to be like because it's, it's kind of mysterious. But yet the Bible does allow us to see some glimpses of what, what it will be like in this in this beautiful chapter, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I think, what am I going to inherit? Well, God says, there's this new heaven and this new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And, and by the way, I don't think that that means that God obliterates or junks the current creation. And that's a very important thing that we're going to notice as we go along this morning. God doesn't junk it. He transforms it. He renews it. As Moses would say, he restores it. He says, the first heaven and the earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. No longer any sea. Now, does that suggest that there won't be water in heaven? I don't think so. Um, you could point to that passage in Revelation 21 about the river of the water of life that th flows from the throne down the middle of the great street of the city or the offer of the water of life or, or even point out that God restores his creation and when he made his creation um, the sea and the oceans were good. In fact he separates the waters above from the waters below and this is the word he says of it and it was good. So what does it mean when we read there wasn't any sea there? Well it isn't necessarily true that there's no bodies of water in the new heavens and the earth, I kind of think there may be, but see. Recall the context. Uh, John is writing from Patmos, an island, and he's exiled to Patmos, and he's writing to fellow Christians who are across the sea, to him anyway. Could it be that he's suggesting that in the new heavens and the earth those things that separate believers uh, will not be there that whether it's time distance disease whatever it is that separates Christian from Christian will be gone well commentators have raise that possibility, but most are also very quick to say in the scriptures uh, there's other things that are meant by the sea too and we think that's part of what's in John's mind as he's writing too because the sea is a symbol of what's chaotic and threatening and dangerous to God's good creation. And by that symbol John may be telling us that things that are dangerous to our well-being or, or uh, hurtful or chaotic to what God's good world is made to be, those things will be gone in the new heavens and the new earth. And we see things that John shares with us that he sees, and we hear things that John shares with us that he hears. So what did he see and hear? Well, he says, God gave me a glimpse of the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It's a holy place. And, and some have suggested the word holy there may not uh, be, first of all, in John's thinking, the idea that it's a righteousness that's there, although it, there will be righteousness there. He may be saying that this is a city unlike any that you've ever seen. It's awesome. It's a new Jerusalem. Oh, I read, and sometimes I hear this uh, in sermons from Reformed pastors too, well, what begins in a garden ends in a city. And I sometimes kind of wince at that 
when they, when they say that, what begins in a garden ends in a city, and it's because I love the country and I'm a country boy. But I think what happened, and we look at this a little further, and I would say, okay, if it begins in Eden in Genesis 1 and it concludes in this chapter in Revelation as the holy city, the new Jerusalem, let me suggest that it's a garden city. It's a city with all kinds of life all through it. Um, because there's water flowing from the throne, waters in that world and in ours till. It sustains and nurture, nurtures and encourages life. And there's a tree there. There's a great tree of life. And it's, I don't know how this could be, but that's what it says, God's mysterious creativity. The, the tree of the water of life, it's on both sides of the river. How can one tree be on both sides? But it is. And it's yielding 12 crops of fruit, a way of saying it's an eternal and everlasting supply of nourishment for life. Reading on about the holy city, its measurements are 12,000 stadia. And that's a term unfamiliar to me and to you. We don't use stadia as a unit of a measure, but if we convert it to ones that we're used to, it's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, and 1,400 miles high. In other words, the New Jerusalem is a perfect cube. It's huge, but a perfect cube. Now, could that be a symbol too? John knew that the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament is a cube. And that was a place where God was present. And he may be suggesting to us that this holy city is huge, but God is everywhere present in that place, that new heaven and that new earth. Other descriptions of the new Jerusalem are using the absolute most precious things he knows. He speaks of jasper, and gold, uh, the city of pure gold. Is it literal gold? Or is it a symbol that tells us that this city is made of the most precious things imaginable? Truly, it is a holy city. It's a city unlike any other, a garden city of life, of God's presence. It's huge. It's beautiful. And we'll get at that in a minute. But there are some things that I think we can say, you know what? I have a taste of that now. And maybe God says to us today, I'll give you a taste of this so that you can have a sense that I have an appetizer and the full meal is before me. Yes, you know something today about what it is to live in God's presence. God is with us. He promised us, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always to the end of the age. But what will it be like in heaven? You know? Being just with God in a, in a beautiful way. And being with each other will be with fellow Christians. We have a sense of what it's like to be together with other Christians today. I mean, we're here. You're Christians. I'm a Christian. It, it's good. But imagine what it's be like to be with the whole community of faith that has stretched from, you know, one end of the world to the other through time. To have that sense of amazing community and then another thing is we can sense something of God's creative skill now in his, creative, in his creation. Uh, when we study it, when we, when we really experience what it's like to, to see a river and how that works and the whole way that water flows and how it returns to the, to the heavens and then to the earth again and there's a water cycle. And when we look at trees, how amazing they are, and they, they lose their leaves, we know. And then they start again in the spring. What a mysterious, creative God we have. And that creative creativity will be on full display in the new heavens and the new earth. 
We mentioned the beauty of the heavenly city. John, I think, as he writes things now, what is, what is the most beautiful reality I can think of that I know? And he thinks of the way a bride looks on her wedding day. And he says, the new Jerusalem, it's like a, a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I say as a believer, wow, that city must be filled with beauty and goodness. So I think John gives us some pretty awesome things that we glimpse about heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. I think there are many symbols that he uses. Uh, Other Christians will disagree with me. Uh, That's fine. One day we'll know who's right. But there's not just things that are seen. And that's what's also interesting about this text. Uh, When we think about restoring, um, there's things that are heard. And in the book of Revelation, most of the time, it's the angels that do the speaking. But in chapter 21, God speaks directly from the throne a couple of times. And what that does is it draws our attention to that and to those words in a special way. Um, What's said? Well, there's this loud voice from the throne. So the king is saying something forcefully. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he'll dwell with them. And we believe that that's because of the work of Christ, that he washed our sins away so that we can be this holy people and be in the presence of God. So look, uh, God's dwelling place is with the people, and he'll dwell with them. They'll be his people. God will be with them and be their God And then we think a little bit about uh, restoration here, right? It says he'll wipe the tears away, every one of them. For those who are crying in life today, God will restore and wipe the tear away. For those who die, which is eventually all of us, God will restore us to life. For those who mourn, God will restore to joy. And then he says another thing forcefully from the throne. I'm making everything new. Write it down. This is trustworthy. This is true. Behold, God says, I'm a restoring God. You have a little bit of a taste of that, an appetizer in yourself if you put your faith in Christ because Paul says, if anybody is in Christ, they're a new creation. Now, that does not mean that I'm no longer me, that I'm not Steve Mulder anymore. But when I put my faith in Christ, God works in my life so that it is true that I'm a new person. Yes, it's still me, but I'm somehow restored, renewed, um, transformed in, by his grace. And it all traces to his gifts to me and his grace the the living water. He says, to the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. God freely offers this life. But to reject his offer is to die. And the way that I think this is pictured is you and I need water, right? If we don't drink water, we don't drink the liquids we need, we will die. Spiritually, if I don't put my faith in Christ and I don't, if I reject his offer, I will die. The last part of our passage makes it clear, doesn't it? It says the cowardly, the unbelieving, and and I think part of that may, in a setting of persecution, refer to those who at one time maybe claimed to be a follower of Jesus, but then when the pressure came and the the persecutor came, they decided to deny Christ and live life's little day in the comfort of, of the Roman Empire instead of being true and faithful to Christ. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the practitioners of magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they're consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, in other words, hell. 
I don't, don't think that John is telling us that if you've ever uh, worshipped something that you shouldn't have worshipped, or if you've ever told a lie that you can't go to heaven. But I do think what he's saying is, there's living water. Drink it. Take Christ in. Because that's where the hope of life is. To reject him, to deny him, to continue on in sin is, is a one-way road to death. But to receive Christ is to receive life. First John 1, verse 5. Who is it that overcomes? It's the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. In our passage, it says, those who are victorious inherit all this. I'll be their God, and they'll be my children. That's a challenge to you and I. I want to be a man of faith today, a man who follows Jesus, my Savior, my Lord. And I want to extend the offer of the water of life to all who are in need of it. Because Jesus himself said, make disciples and baptize and teach. I want to extend the good offer of salvation to everyone who I can, who I can realistically reach in my, in my life and in my ministry. But there's another application point I want to share. I said that when God saved me, he didn't make me not Steve anymore. And I think that's a clue to what he does when he says there's a new heaven and a new earth God doesn't junk the current creation and say, I'm going to do something completely new. There are Christians who hold to that, and some evangelicals will say, well, because of that, it really doesn't matter how we treat this world. It's all going to go to pot anyway. And I would say, no, that's not the, the biblical picture. The idea is that God restores his world. He takes what is here. He's, he cares for what's here too much to junk it. And if he cares for what's here, shouldn't I? Because I love him and I, I want to follow him and I want to respect him and honor him. You know, you wouldn't, if, you, if some craftsman makes some beautiful thing and you throw it on the ground and break it, not caring for it, that's not very respectful to the one who made that thing. And so too with God. God has made this beautiful creation and he's restoring it. And that means that he cares for it. And I should too. I share this picture of, okay, this is my favorite president. He was from the Reformed Church of America. He's got a Reformed background. And I feel that it shows in what he did. Teddy Roosevelt. This is something that Teddy said. A nation behaves well if it treats its natural resources as assets that it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value. I love that. And I believe that it tells us that he is, in Queen Elizabeth's words, a true statesman. That's something I want to be too. Turn whatever I have over to the next ones, not impaired, but increased. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the picture and the sounds of heaven that John shares with us. Now, the way that this was interpreted by Pastor Steve this morning is that there's a lot of symbolism here in this book. And we know there are Christians who uh, feel differently, that they may take it more literally. Either way, this is a glorious future for your people. And either way, Help us to live faithfully with you today, extending the, the offers of living water to those around us in Christ and the hope that's in Christ. Even as we look forward to the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
And treat your world with respect today too. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's respond and we'll have an opportunity to sing. Um, Jerusalem the Golden, uh, this is a, a beautiful song. It's, it's one that uh, means a lot to me. Uh, so let's stand and sing. It's uh, 488, 1-4, Jerusalem the Golden. Looking forward to that, and let's state our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he'll come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen.
And now may our triune God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to just shine on you now and in this coming week. May he turn his face to each of you and grant you his peace. Amen. Another favorite, By the Sea of Crystal, 489, verses 1 to 3, our closing hymn.